Tonight, man stands on the threshold of outer space. Now, since the Russian satellite was launched a week ago, it's covered some three million miles. Well, does this now mean that space travel is a practical possibility? Can man build a vehicle that will take him not only to the moon, but to the planets as well? And having built one, can he equip himself to survive in the emptiness of space? And in any case, what practical benefits can we expect from man's first big step away from the Earth? This is what Frontiers of Science looks into tonight. And in the course of this program, you will see the forerunner of a spacesuit developed for the RAF, and this will be the first time it's ever been shown publicly. But first of all, let's hear from Sir Harold Spencer Jones, the Astronomer Royal. Well, let's look briefly at what has gone before the launching of the Russian satellite. I have here a globe six foot diameter uh, representing our Earth, on which, however, the mountains are shown in a very much exaggerated scale. Now, on the scale of the size of the Earth, I have here uh, five little pins, uh, the smallest of them, about a twentieth of an inch long, uh, represents Mount Everest, five and a half miles high, the highest point on the Earth, which man succeeded in climbing after many failures. Uh, here uh, we have a longer pin representing the greatest height which man has so far reached above the surface of the Earth. Uh, Dr. Simons went up in a balloon uh, not so very long ago to a height of nearly 20 miles. But small animals, mice and monkeys, have been sent in rockets to a still greater height, about seven miles represented uh, by this pin. During the war, the Germans launched the V-2 rocket. Many of you, no doubt, have very unpleasant memories of that, which reached a height of about 125 miles. And this largest pin represents uh, approximately the height at which the artificial satellite is traveling. Now, just let's look for a moment at what is involved in launching an artificial satellite. It's projected by means of a three-stage rocket, which is fired vertically and turned over, and when moving in a horizontal direction, the satellite is projected. Now, if the speed of projection is not sufficient, the rocket will travel a certain distance over the surface of the Earth and fall down to the Earth. With a higher speed, it will reach a greater distance, but if we get to a speed of 18,000 miles an hour, or five miles a second, it will not fall down on the Earth, it will be continually falling, but it will completely circle the Earth, its uh, centrifugal force just balancing the force of gravity. Of course, one likes to have a margin for error, and so it's projected with slightly higher speed, and in that case, its distance uh, the point opposite its projection is somewhat greater than the point from which it's projected. Now, let us think of going beyond that and increasing the speed still further. In that case, the orbit becomes more and more elliptical. At the point opposite uh, the point of projection, it's further and further away from the Earth until when one reaches a speed of 25,000 miles an hour, about seven miles a second, uh, the orbit opens up, it doesn't close, and the vehicle will go off into interplanetary space. I have here, uh, just to show you, give you some idea of what these little bodies are like, an actual scale model of the American satellite uh, showing the instrumentation, very complex instrumentation. Here are the aerials uh, for transmitting signals to the Earth. The Russian satellite is not instrumented like this. It merely has uh, batteries and radio transmitters uh, for sending signals. Now, in going out into interplanetary space, of course our first target would be the Moon, because that is our nearest neighbor in space. And here is a model of the Moon on the same scale as the Earth, about half the diameter, about one sixty-fourth of the volume. I can't in the studio show uh, the Earth and the Moon correct to size and to distance, so we had these models taken out into a field and photographed, and there you see them in their correct uh, relative distances, 180 yards apart. Uh, here I have um, uh, two small models representing the Earth and the Moon, a uh, correct scale uh, with their distance apart. Now, if we 
shot a body straight off from the Earth uh, to the Moon with a speed of uh, 25,000 miles a second. It would take roughly 10 hours to reach the Moon because the distance of the Moon is about a quarter of a million miles. Actually, of course, one would send it off in a curved path, starting in a direction parallel to the Earth. And I think the first thing that should be attempted is to uh, send a small unmanned satellite around the Moon, the back of the Moon, to take photographs of the back of the Moon which man has never seen. Uh, to send manned satellites, of course, is a very much bigger problem because you have to have larger satellites and heavier and so on. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sir Harold. I introduce you as the Astronomer Royal. Of course, you are the former Astronomer Royal. Well, you seem remarkably confident about our ability to get to the Moon, but meteorites, don't they present really serious hazard? Well, they do present a hazard. Here is a meteorite. Uh, this is one of a number of chunks of matter which are wandering about through space. Most of them are very much smaller than this, many, in fact, smaller than the P. But there are thousands of millions of them which come into our atmosphere every day. They do certainly present a hazard. It's difficult to estimate how serious, but the chance of being hit by anything as large as this is certainly extremely small. Well, it's one wouldn't like to be hit by one, but Sir Harold, uh, the last week you wrote in a magazine that you thought travel to Mars and Venus would be quite out of the question. Now, on what grounds did you say that? Well, I still think that, because, uh, as I say, to get from the Earth to the Moon is a comparatively short journey, something over ten hours. But to get to either Mars or Venus means a journey of many months, possibly a year or longer. And that means a very large vehicle to carry the men together with their food and drink and supplies of oxygen and so on. And it does increase to such an enormous extent the complexity of the problem that I can't see it being done but apart for from centuries. Yes, but I see, apart from time and carrying food, aren't there? surely there must be greater problems than that, aren't there? The problems of... Uh, of actually travelling to Mars. Well, there are problems of navigation. Uh, navigation in space of three dimensions involves uh, quite a number of problems. They're rather technical. <coughs> it would be necessary to carry a, an electronic computer, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, as I held, as an astronomer, what practical benefits do you think will come out of all this? Well, of course, many people look forward to building a station out in space, a space station, and to setting up telescopes and other instruments on it. And if that was achieved, it would undoubtedly have very great scientific value, because we could get all sorts of observations, astronomical and others, where we are not hampered by a dense atmosphere through which we mm -hmm. have to view things from the Earth. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sir Harold. Well, sir, it seems that the astronomers are pretty confident about our ability to be able to travel into outer space and certainly to the moon. But the engineers, are they so confident? Just how big are their problems? Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Now this is the British Skylark rocket which you just saw being launched at the Woomera rocket range in Australia. Uh, but this little piece of hardware only travels up into the sky a mere hundred miles or so. So obviously there are great technical engineering feats that are faced or have to be faced by engineers like Dr. Alex Baxter who was formerly a professor of propulsion at the College of Aeronautics, Cranfield and is now chief executive of nuclear engineering and rockets at de Havilland. Now, we always seem to assume that to get into outer space, we've got to use rockets, Dr. Baxter. Now, why exactly have we got to use a rocket? Well, the answer is quite simply that the rocket engine is not only the most powerful type we know, but it's the only one that will work outside the Earth's atmosphere. And the reason for that is that it carries its own oxygen with it to burn with a fuel instead of trying to use the oxygen in the air as other types do. Now, in this a Skylark, for example, the oxygen is combined with uh, the fuel in a, a solid propellant uh, type, rather like a, a firework. But in uh, some of the larger rockets, it's much better to use a liquid type. And here, for example, we have 
a simple experiment that demonstrates how the oxygen may be in one tank as a liquid and the fuel in another tank as a liquid forced out into jets and then squirted out into the rocket forming a uh, gas which is forced out of the uh, chamber and gives the urge which is necessary to uh, push the rocket forward. Now you'll see the jet and there is the flame operating and that is of course quite a small uh, jet compared with the rocket's uh, requirements uh, such as the uh, Russian satellite. There we might have used something like a hundred gallons a second. Um, well now then to uh, uh, put that into a rocket means very large tanks. So perhaps we ought to have a look at a uh, rocket, see how the tanks fit into the thing. Here you see the oxidizer tank and the fuel tank and they s are pushed out by pumps or by pressure into the combustion chamber and ignited and then the gases come out through the exhaust at the back and at very high velocities the reaction pushes the rocket uh, forward. Now the speed at which that gas comes out is uh, very high, it's very high temperature and you can see uh, a film of this uh, occurring, a jet coming out which is, um, shows uh, the high speed and high energy that is available and you may be able to see the shock pattern, the diamond formation which is characteristic of all uh, rockets. Now if uh, this is all successful then we have got a problem to consider uh, with regard to the weight of the rocket. Now we want to make get as much propellant into the rocket as possible and yet make it as light as possible mm -hmm. and you will see uh, a diagram which shows the V2, if we make the structure of that one unit, the V2 carried something like three units of fuel and that gave it a speed of about one mile a second. Now we can improve on that nowadays and one unit of structure will give us perhaps seven units of fuel and that would give us something like uh, two miles a second. But that's a long way still from the five miles a second that Sir Harold Spencer Jones mentioned for an orbital rocket. And to do that we'd need 49 units of fuel to one unit of structure. And to escape to the moon we'd need something like 99 units of fuel and seven miles a second. Well that looks a certainly a very much bigger rocket than the others. Just how big would it have to be? Well I think perhaps we might compare it with, uh, uh, I think before we compare it with that we should consider a way of escaping uh, from uh, uh, the Earth with a three uh, multi-stage rocket because that would be a very heavy rocket perhaps that one would weigh something like um, one ton of takeoff weight for uh, a pound, two pounds uh, of payload but um, we can overcome that structural problem by using uh, a rocket which uh, uh, carries another rocket at two miles a second drops away and the second rocket will then go forward at another two miles a second giving you a total of four miles a second and a third stage would accelerate to perhaps six miles a second. So in that way we could get uh, to uh, velocities which would give us uh, space uh, conditions. Now from, uh, from there we can consider the size of such a rocket and I think that if we considered it in relation to Trafalgar Square you would find that we had uh, uh, something which would hide uh, Nelson's column. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, now, it seems to me, uh, Professor Baxter, from what you just said, that the greatest problem facing you as an engineer is to find a powerful enough and light enough fuel which won't take too much space off in a rocket. Does this mean you've got to wait for nuclear engineering to power one? Nuclear power? No, I think there are uh, better fuels uh, perhaps just round the corner, but uh, uh, we couldn't yet use uh, nuclear power because, after all, uh, a nuclear power plants are a very heavy thing and we've been emphasizing how light this must be so I think in the future we may get that but it's rather a long way off. Now just how soon do you think we'll be able to get? 60 years? Oh I 70? think um, we ought to be able to uh, get a manned flight uh, to the moon within this century anyhow. Well thank you very much indeed. So the uh, engineers just like the astronomer we spoke to 
uh, seem pretty confident about space travel. But what about man himself? Are the doctors sure that man will be able to survive in outer space? Now this is the special study of a doctor at the RAF Institute of Aviation at Farnborough. Now remember, we're thinking in terms of putting a man inside this rocket. And that gives rise to quite a few medical problems. So well, let's go back to the beginning again, the takeoff. Now we know we can fasten the man up inside his cabin so that he takes his environment with him, his terrestrial environment. That is, the air he breathes, his food, and so on. But what about the accelerations of takeoff? And later, the accelerate, or rather the zero G, the absence of gravity. We know a great deal about the effects of these accelerations on the human body, and we study them on the human centrifuge. We have a film here showing the operation of the centrifuge. The arm which rotates carries a cabin at the end in which the subject sits. As it rotates, it produces a centrifugal force like an increased force of gravity. In effect, the man gets heavier. In the case you're about to see, the subject will be stressed to a force of about 5G, that is five times the force of gravity. The subject is now strapping himself into the seat. And I'd like to add that this is the sort of sensation all pilots experience during flight and it doesn't produce any more stress than say being in a rugby scrum. The centrifuge is now rotating at the speed equivalent to 5G and you can see the effect of this increased gravitational force on the subject now. It's coming on, it takes considerable effort to overcome this load. Of course, um, if the force lasted several minutes, he would have to be lying down. He can't do much whilst this force is on him. Physical movement is almost impossible. And what we have done, we put a room at the end of this arm so that we can observe the effects of increased gravitational forces on subjects whilst they try to move around. The controller is now ready to start the centrifuge again. This time with a subject moving across this end barrier or room. With a centrifuge stationary, it has no problem at all. It's quite easy. When it's rotating to produce 2G, that is twice the force of gravity, his body is twice as heavy, and you can see the struggle he has to move. It is now a considerable physical effort for him. He struggles back to his original position. The same sequence now at 3G, three times the force of gravity. This is the force he was experiencing if he were a space traveler and he'd landed on Jupiter. Jupiter is a larger planet than the Earth and in consequence has a much larger gravity. You can see he can hardly move at all under the force of 3G. In the next case, where I was a subject, you can see starting feet first, it was impossible to make any progress at all. The body was pinned up against this end barrier. But for the takeoff in rocket flight, with automatic controls, there shouldn't be any problem, provided the, any effort you required of the man was done by minute finger movements. Now, what about the other stresses? Well, there is the absence of stress with zero G, no gravity at all. At some period in the rocket flight, everything will be stationary, weightless, and still. No gravity at all. We have a film here of the effect of zero G on some mice. Here you see the mice being prepared to be sent up in this high altitude rocket. They were placed in little containers inside the rocket. Now then, at the top of the rocket's flight, whilst it was falling, there wouldn't be any gravity exerted on these mice. There it is on its way up. Zero G has affected their balance. They are disorientated. Now a sense organ inside the ear normally gives us our sense of balance when gravity acts on it. One of the mice had this sense organ destroyed and he wasn't bothered about zero G. He'd learned with practice to use his eyes alone to give him a sense of balance. Here are the mice after the run, quite fit and healthy. So with the man, we would be faced with this problem of disorientation. Here's a monkey. This is the highest animal in the world. He's been up in one of these rockets. 
problem of disorientation with a man, and also problem with moving his limbs. His limbs wouldn't go where he wanted them because they were weightless. Again, under zero G, our body wouldn't be able to regulate its temperature. Normally, the body is continually producing heat. And one of the ways in which we control this heat production is by losing heat by air convection. Here you see convection currents of, of air rising from the hand and carrying heat away. This effect would not be observed under zero G conditions. It depends on gravity, because the air next to the skin gets less dense, less heavy, and therefore rises. We could minimize this effect by use of an air ventilated suit. Here is such a, a suit. The air enters this suit by this pipe and is distributed over the body and this suit is worn next to the skin. This would cool the man. So it, it is one solution to this particular problem. Whilst we're discussing this um, air circulation, it's an air problem, there's also something else. Dust wouldn't settle. Bits of fluff, bits of wire, anything that happened to be loose would float in the air and the man would be in, have a serious risk of inhaling these foreign bodies into his mouth. Again, the body produces very toxic substances in small quantities, gases and so on from the bowel. And chemical extraction of these on the long-term project would be very, very difficult. In fact, an explosive air mixture could result after several weeks or months in a confined space. Other body functions uh, depend on gravity, drainage of tears from the eyes and so on. And again, with so little effort required for whole body movement, you can understand that after a period of weeks or months, the person would very rapidly um, lose his muscular power and get weak, just as if he'd been ill in bed for a long time. Again, his heart would get weak, and you can imagine the space traveler, when he landed on his other planet, as soon as gravity exerted itself, as soon as he tried to stand up, he'd fall down in a faint. But I think we should now consider one of the most important accessories of such a space flight. That is, the space suit. Well, Doctor, that's just what I want to ask you about. This forerunner of the space suit developed for the RAF, which we're now going to see publicly for the first time, just how big a step forward is it? Well, there's a, a very long step between the partial pressure suit, which has been shown before, and this particular suit you see now. Perhaps we can have this inflated and you can see the action. See, space is a vacuum and the suit has to be pressurized. I think it looks like every boy's idea of a real space suit. <laughs> can you move around? Could you take it off? One of the most difficult engineering problems of the, in designing such a suit is to provide an adequate range of physical movement whilst the man is pressurized. Well, I can see he seemed to move around all right. Were you uncomfortable? You're sweating furiously now, but were you really uncomfortable in it? I was a little hot. Um, I think the reason there is that uh, if you are hot and you don't get sufficient ventilation, then uh, of course you just sweat and get even worse. Yes, but what exactly have been the biggest problems you've had to overcome to live in a kind of a vacuum, which you obviously must have done, to test the suit out? Uh, well, if you're going to live in a vacuum, uh, you have to breathe oxygen as a technical convenience, uh, yet it would save enormously if you can pressurise yourself with air. There you have two systems and, uh, as you see, two pipes leading to me. Mm -hmm. Maintaining a balance between those two so that you don't become uncomfortable mm -hmm. is, quite, is quite a problem. Not only that, but you have the pressurisation which causes your limbs to tend to stiffen out and the bending them, of course, might be difficult with bad well, design. This this well, suit yes. actually would only be used in an emergency. Normally, he'd be in a space cabin. But and it, wouldn't protect, yes. Go on, so it wouldn't protect him again from uh, cosmic radiation. I see. But, but there's one, you've obviously studied I mean, the effects of high altitude flying on men. Do you see any biological reason why they shouldn't, man I, shouldn't be able to exist in outer space? I don't see, I, well, I can say with confidence that there is no single medical factor which prevents 
manned space travel. Well, that's a pretty categorical statement and said very confidently. Thank <laughs> you very much. Now, there's one group of uh, people who've come very much into the picture since the launching of the Russian uh, satellite, and that's those who belong to the British Interplanetary Society. Now, some people think that the members of it are too visionary and the society is too premature. But uh, we have one member of the society who has this answer to give. Well, the British Interplanetary Society most certainly isn't premature, and I think there's a very good parallel to that in the Royal Aeronautical Society, which was formed long before aeroplanes flew. In fact, it was long after the formation of that society that one famous American astronomer proved to his own satisfaction that aeroplanes could never fly at all. Well, nobody in the British Interplanetary Society underestimates the difficulties, but they have made very considerable contributions to what has been going on, and in particular, a good deal of the early theoretical work on Earth satellite was carried out by its members. Uh, many members of, of the society hold official positions in government establishments, and it must be realized that in these days, uh, all practical rocket research must be done at government level. That's partly because of the tremendous cost of the equipment, and partly because of security, because in these days, uh, so much rocket research is being misdirected towards military requirements. Well, that was uh, Patrick Moore, who is a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society, and I must say, Mr. Moore, you're a very spirited protagonist of your society. Now, by way of summing up, I'm going to talk to one of the most distinguished physicists in the country, Sir Edward Bullard, who was formerly director of the National Physical Laboratory, and who is now at Cambridge University. Now, I know you've been following this program very closely, Sir Edward. What do you consider to be the biggest problem that has to be solved? Well, I think the biggest problem has been solved already. The biggest problem is getting off the ground and through the air and into the orbit. This requires these enormous engines. Uh, once you're in your orbit, uh, you've got time to think what you're doing next, and you don't require these very great forces, and all kinds of possibilities open up. I think it's impossible to exaggerate the importance of the uh, success of recent work in America and Russia. Mm -hmm. But what do you think of the real possibilities of interplanetary travel? For example, do you agree with Sir Harold Spencer Jones that whereas it would be possible to get to the moon, it isn't possible in the foreseeable future, if at all possible, to get to planets like Mars and Venus? Well, you know, I don't agree. Uh, what Sir Harold said, in effect, was that if you go on a long journey, you need a lot of luggage, and uh, therefore your rockets would have to be very large and carry a lot of odds and ends. Well, uh, this is a problem of structures and fuel, and primarily a problem of fuel, and one can see all, all sorts of possibilities of improved fuels. It seems very unlikely that the one we've got now, um, petrol and oxygen, is the best. There are many others which we haven't time to talk about tonight, and uh, some very peculiar ones. For example, I recently saw in America small bits of gas kicked out at 300 kilometers a second. And this kind of thing uh, opens enormous possibilities, I think, for the next step from the satellite. Nuclear power? I don't know, uh, really. It's a, it's a difficult one. I think there are other things will come first. I don't, uh, I don't think the first... Uh, I think we'll, we'll get along without it for some time. So, Edward, it's been suggested in more than one quarter that the main advantages of travel to outer space are military ones. Do you agree with that view? Um, well, I am dubious if, if the military ones are an advantage. Yes, um, am I. And, mm -hmm. But there certainly are um, civilian advantages of a kind. If you could look at the Earth's atmosphere from the outside, you could follow the weather systems and get, I think, very much improved weather forecasts. Uh, you could uh, get uh, the pleasures of looking at the American television from a relay station and a satellite and vice, uh, and vice versa. But these are rather minor things and you know I don't really believe that these great enterprises uh, depend on a delicate balance of uh, gain and loss. I, I think uh, that to do these projects uh, you've got to have an, emotion, an emotional drive to do them that in a sense they're things of the spirit that you've, uh, you've got to feel uh, that you want to do them. It's rather like the Egyptians building the pyramids. The pyramids are obviously no good but they built them and I think uh, this may be our pyramid. I see. Well thank you very much indeed Sir Edward. Well, all through this program, I've marveled at the confidence of the speakers. And I'm also wondering if there isn't someone among you now who isn't going to be the first person to step on the moon. Good night. <laughs>